Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Ian Garcia. This is Devotional Criticism, and this is the new movie diary in which I tell you about new, recent, and up-and-coming releases and try to give you straight facts about them in my humble opinion. This past Thursday, I paid a visit to the lovely Quad Cinema in New York City to see Rise, a new French drama directed by Cédric Clapiche, co-written by Clapiche and screenwriter Santiago Amigoreno. Originally released in France in March of last year, Rise, or En Corps, meaning In Body, is Clapiche's 14th feature film, and if his name doesn't really ring any particular bells, don't worry about it. I also wasn't familiar at all with him until a couple of weeks ago when I first became aware that this film would be getting a limited release this June, courtesy of Blue Fox Entertainment. And I'll be real that what mainly piqued my interest interest in seeing this film at all was that it concerns the worlds of ballet and contemporary dance, and I'm kind of a sucker for films about dance. I think oftentimes even rather mediocre directors when dealing with dance as a subject or a setting, I don't know what it is, maybe it's just that part of the athleticism and the energy of one medium of expression really inflames the passions of another. And that was something I really tried to keep in mind without building up my expectations for what the movie was going to be too much because in the week leading up to seeing Rise, and again, I'm still not some sort of expert in Clapiche's oeuvre, I'm very very much coming into this with a rather limited impression of him as a screenwriter and a director. But I must admit, in the week leading up to seeing Rise and trying to research Clapiche and see as many of his films as possible that are easily accessible in the U.S. anyway, at least via streaming, I must admit that leading up to seeing Rise, I haven't been very fond of what films by Clapiche I have seen. Like, at all. Clapiche is a director who has been working in feature films since the early 90s, and I've only seen three of his other films besides Rise, so again, take all of this with a grain of salt. These are thoughts maybe coming from the mind of someone who maybe sprinted through what I could see of Clapiche uh, rather too quickly, maybe didn't really have the opportunity to really sink my teeth into his superior works. But I did start off doing my homework by watching The Spanish Apartment, which was released all the way back in 2002, and in addition to being Clapiche's most financially successful and popular film, was also something of his international breakthrough. It was nominated for several César Awards, which is basically the national French equivalent of the Academy Awards. It was nominated for Best Writing, Best Director, and Best Film. And man, I saw The Spanish Apartment, and I was just completely bored out of my mind by it. And I don't mean boring like some vulgarian, anti-international, or slow burn drama film kind of thing where I'm just sitting here huffing like, this is so boring. Nothing happens in this movie, and it goes on forever. I mean that just quite frankly, I was not just entirely unimpressed by it, but like viscerally aggravated to an extent that I really can't fathom why it got the accolades that it did and still maintains such a high reputation. As an introduction to Clapiche's filmmaking, it turns out that one of his most popular and well-regarded movies was just the wrong way to go. I also saw Paris uh, from 2008, which was also nominated at the César Awards for Best Film. Film, and I guess the best way to describe that is as a hyperlink movie, which is sort of a catch-all term to describe this style of cinema that really started coming into vogue in the new millennium with movies like Crash and Amores Peros and Gomorra. So, you know, Paris is very much a part of that vogue where it's this ensemble, multi-linear drama with a bunch of separate plot threads that interweave in different ways, and I also didn't really care for that one at all. And with Paris, for me, that was a really classic case with that style of hyperlink movie where I felt like any one or two of the individual narratives within it could have made for a rather compelling movie on its own, but where it's not just that I don't think in the over two-hour runtime of the 
the movie. It's not just that I don't think the individual narratives were explored well enough. It's like a textbook case with that sort of hyperlink style of, of movie and the most basic technical critique you can make of them is that it's actually that the compositing of all of these different narratives together kind of betrays not only the self-indulgence of the filmmaker, but also their kind of shallow lack of ideas that throwing all of these stories into a pod and mixing them together doesn't really elevate them all through their shared themes, but just sort of emphasizes the superficiality of Klapisch's writing, the inattention to not just writing scenes that might be individually interesting or engaging, especially if you lean heavily on your cast to kind of bring them to life and justify their vitality, but also just the inattention to rendering this cross-linear narrative as something that on its whole has compelling conflicts and resolutions that aren't just do ex machina stuff. I mean, it was Definitely a better film than The Spanish Apartment, but I'm still in the reactive fugue where I can quite confidently, if not necessarily critically, say that The Spanish Apartment is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. So saying that Puri is better than The Spanish Apartment isn't saying much, it's just to me self-evident that Puri is better acted, the production quality was better, those individual narratives, while underexplored, are more dramatically interesting, but at the end of the day it was still very much an experience of a movie where it felt like and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And so I wasn't as aggravatingly bored by it as I was with The Spanish Apartment, but by the end of it I was really still quite bored, and I can pretty much say all of the same with Someone Somewhere, which was Klapisch's most recent film, After Rise, and again, did not make me so bored that I was kind of irrationally resentful of the world, but certainly, again, despite some interesting in individual scenes and some decent performances and solid production just worked out to be just a boring, frictionless experience for me. And that, again, coming from a very under-initiated experience, is exactly how I would characterize my assessment of what Klapisch movies I have seen. There's a frictionlessness to them, an absence of any real hooks to get me to actually feel something for the characters he creates and the scenarios that he contrives rather than at a certain point just kind of zoning out and waiting for all of it to just be over. So over the course of the last week, I kind of went from being really rather enthusiastic about seeing Rise to being in the most mean-spirited and probably wrong-footed state of mind about it. Because even though I've only seen three of Klapisch's many films, I kind of feel like if you see three films by the same director and all made within a 20-year period, and two of them at least are actually rather highly regarded within his body of works, then I think it's okay if you come away from them with the definitive feeling that he's just kind of a popular hack. Sure, it's only three movies, but that's three movies scattered at the beginning, middle, and end of two decades of a run, and all three of those movies are two hours, and all three are boring, frictionless, trite stuff that is basically no different than any number of blasé, bourgeois dramas and romantic comedies that I see plenty of in the United States anyway. So yeah, I was starting off on the wrong foot, and I'm honestly just ranting at this point, so before I kind of compromise myself further, especially to any Spanish apartment defenders out there, let's just try to put our critical thinking caps on, try to be a tad more objective, forget whatever I've thought or decided about Clapiche up to this point, and just start off with what Rise or En Corps is all about. Rise stars Marion Barbeau as Elise, a Parisian prima ballerina to whom we are introduced on the opening night of her company's performance of La Bayadere, in which she dances the leading role. Before taking the stage, Elise witnesses her lover, who portrays the male lead in the production, making out with one of the other dancers. Despite this, Elise manages to maintain her composure throughout the ballet, but during its crucial apotheosis, she sustains an injury to her ankle. It turns out that this same ankle has 
has been a weak point for Elise throughout her entire career and that she has already continued to perform as dancers like athletes often do through several similar injuries. A doctor informs her that in order to recover, she will have to refrain from dancing for at least two years. There is also the possibility that she will require surgery that in itself will severely limit her future flexibility. Even in the best case scenario for a woman in her mid-20s, this single incident potentially signals the end of her professional career. Her physical therapist, Jan, played by Francois Seville, who it turns out was himself in a relationship with the very ballerina who Elise's lover was having an affair with, is more optimistic about her future prospects, and he encourages Elise to use this time to not only physically, but also emotionally heal from her heartbreak. Her sisters also encourage her to not give up on her dreams, going so far as to invoke the spirit of their mother, who passed away when Elise was quite young, and who was the chief support of her early ballet training. Their father, Henry, Denis Podalides, he, on the other hand, a lawyer who prefers literature to the performing arts and who always behaved rather coldly and indifferently to his daughter's pursuits, takes the position that these events were, in some sense, more than likely always inevitable. Either by injury or by age, Elise's ballet dreams could not last forever, and it's better that she start thinking of alternatives now rather than later. And the ironic thing is that while Elise is quite emotionally estranged from her father, she seems to adapt rather quickly to his sense of sober fatalism. She spends very little time mourning either her decommissioning from the dance world or the end of her relationship, and instead turns to the advice of her friend Sabrina, Sohela Jakob. Sabrina herself is a retired ballet dancer who now works here and there as an actress and a model, but mostly assists her husband Loic, Pio Marmai, who is an independent chef who operates a food trailer that he drags around with a red van in which he and Sabrina sleep. When Sabrina and Loic accept a job catering for a resort in Brittany specialized to host artist companies, Elise tags along with them as an assistant. It just so happens, however, that the occupants of the hotel for the next few weeks will be none other than a contemporary dance troupe led by the world-renowned choreographer, dancer, and composer, Ho. Fesh Schechter, who plays himself in the movie. Elise had previously encountered Schechter's company when a fellow ballerina's boyfriend invited them to see them at a modern dance conservatory hosting them in Paris, and though she accepted the job in Brittany largely to get away from both Paris and dance, Elise finds herself as inspired by and drawn to these exciting new kinds of dance now as she was then. First invited by Schechter to participate in the company's rehearsals, then falling in in love with one of its members, Mehdi Baki, playing himself, another dancer. It may be that one chance encounter presents Elise with all the keys to not only her physical, but also her emotional healing. Or rather, you know, it's a foregone conclusion. Look, I may not be an expert in Cedric Kaplish's uh, films any more than I'm an expert in ballet or modern dance, but I've seen enough of Kaplish's movies to know this. The guy doesn't make terribly cerebral films. He doesn't even make very philosophical or meditative films. He may not be what you would call a populist, despite its trajectory from classical dance to contemporary dance. Rise is certainly no step up spin-off or rip-off or anything. But Rise is also not a movie that appeals to either a valence of conflict resolution, action-oriented cinema, or to a more critical study of character or setting or theme. This is a light, airy, largely feel-good movie that is largely consistent with Klapisch's mostly light, airy style, and while I'm going to try to be balanced and charitable about all of this, I can't help but stress the primary takeaway from Rise being largely the same as all the other Klapisch films that I've seen, and the word is frictionless. There are no real conflicts at the heart of Rise. There are only the pretenses of conflicts, the generalities of conflicts. If you could tell that I was getting really bored giving you that plot synopsis, you already know that I don't need to spoil anything about the film for you. You're already irrevocably spoiled on it by the tone in my voice. You you know how this story of a bird with a broken wing is going to end, and it's not going to end with any real ambiguity or ambivalence or nuance. This is on the most mild side of the feel-good movie. 
Rise is not a movie about what it's actually like to be someone who devotes all of their life and energy to one particular craft and then is faced with the despair of knowing that they may never get to do it again. It's a movie about a heroine who pretty much from the beginning to the end just intuitively follows her own compass and everywhere it leads her is always in the right direction. With maybe the exception of Elise's disconnection from her father, there are literally no conflicts in this movie that aren't resolved in the most frictionless, easygoing way possible, even to the extent of characters being confronted with them and resolving them within a single scene. And look, there's an extent to which even in that sense, I can absolutely, and I guess seeing Rise helped me to appreciate more about what Klapish does here, but attempts to do throughout his filmography. The most charitable way that I can put it is that Klapish is more attracted to using the broad stroke of more formulaic kinds of popular cinema as an opportunity to weave together more slice-of-life style narratives where conflicts are not so much there to be resolved as they are to be presented as a kind of eerie impertinence and unhappy fact of the modern human condition. So besides the narrative being primarily focused on Elise, there's this whole marginal subplot to the film about Jan, her physical therapist, going on his own off-screen journey of self-discovery and coming back more or less convinced without stating it explicitly that he and Elise are destined to be with one another. And I actually do really like how Klapish interpolates this subplot into the story and how effortlessly he plays with both of the characters' cluelessness, Jan's cluelessness about what a fantasist he's being, and Elise's own either cluelessness or willful obliviousness of just how in love with her Jan has become. I do have to say one of the best scenes in this movie comes rather early and it's when first Elise is on Jan's table in his physical therapy office and he's working on her and when he reveals that it was his girlfriend who her boyfriend was having an affair with he starts breaking down and having an anxiety attack and crying and then she gets off the table to console him and then he lays down on the table and so now she's supporting him. It's actually a pretty ingenious and not really laugh out loud funny, but a very subtly done scene that I actually really enjoyed. But the way Jan's own only partially seen arc as a character weaves in and out of Elise's primary story is fascinating in and of itself, and it's the sort of thing that even if you find the rest of the film rather unengaging, it sticks with you, and it makes you think, maybe I don't want to try to sit through two hours of that again again, but maybe I appreciate a filmmaker doing something that intuitive, that experimental with the form of actually coloring just ever so much outside the lines of a more formulaic, feel-good narrative. But at the end of the day, what you're getting from it all is a film that has all of the kind of flitty, stereotypically French impertinence of a more thematic foreign art film, but with all of the kind of treacle and trite of the most by-the-number chick flick. And quite frankly, if anything, Klapisha's major weakness, not unlike what happens with an even more indulgent ensemble film like Paris, his major weakness is that one of the signature aspects of his style is that he attempts to shoehorn so much of this kind of slice of light floating redundancy into a clean two hours that he basically adopts this almost Godardian approach to editing between scenes where scenes start and end so abruptly and so there's really no moments that ever have a chance to settle and to breathe much less to give us a credible feeling of time passing or even how much time is passing. That was something I especially hated about the Spanish apartment, and which isn't much improved over the decades, is this feeling of the settings that Clapice chooses never really feeling lived in, or the time that passes never really feeling lived through. The entire events of Rise could have occurred in a week, and despite the character's rather serious injury, for as seriously as the filmmakers take the theme of physical trauma in dance, which is to say, not at all, for as seriously as they take it, you might as well tell me that Elise just got her boo-boo kissed and it got better. It just 
just doesn't feel like it has any gravity or matters at all. And all of these things wouldn't technically be so annoying, except that of all of Klapisha's signatures as a filmmaker, the one that I find the most insulting, no joke, is the way that so often his movies have these really stylized and sometimes quite kinetic credits or opening sequences that only stand out in the most superficial ways, but just do not at all give an accurate impression of the kind of clipped, flat style of how the narrative is actually going to proceed. And it's not even just that it doesn't give an accurate impression. Quite frankly, it's that it feels like such an obvious bait and switch. It feels like, oh, look, here it is. Get ready for this exciting, hip, modern movie that is keyed into this very stylized cinematic language. And then the rest of the movie is almost exclusively two hours of the most generic, thinly drawn characters on the face of the earth talking and poncing around Brittany getting drunk, basically. And I thought I was going to escape that kind of thing with Rise once the movie starts and we're backstage at the Paris Opera and Elise and all the ballerinas are just stretching and Elise is getting ready to take the stage. I'm just thinking, oh, finally, something more patient, something less pretentious, something that isn't going to be just this screaming dissonance with the rest of this two-hour glorified ensemble therapy session. But then, no, the credits come in and this roaring, like, Assyrian black metal-styled score comes in and it's like, God damn it, Klapish, your movie is not metal. Stop it! And look, that's not me knocking the music. It turns out that Hofes Schechter also composed the music for the film along with Thomas Bangalter of Daft Punk. And once we finally get to the final performance that this story is all building towards, when that piece comes back again, how does it fare? It's all right. It's fine, it's got a cool atmosphere to it, but the thing is that the harsh juxtaposition between it and La Bayadere is not nearly as interesting as Clapiche seems to think it is. And at the end of the day, you might as well save it all for the ending, because none of it is really true to the mood of Rise, which is neither really 19th century ballet or contemporary metal music, but just, honestly, the most mediocre background study beats that you can find. But I ought to just go ahead and cut to the point because this is a dance movie, Ian. What about the dancing? What about the dancing? And I will say that as a dance movie, as a movie where it really ought to live and die on its dance sequences, I gotta say, Clapiche impresses me by doing pretty good. I mean, it's not reinventing the wheel. Now, there are really only two main dance pieces in the movie besides ones that seem to be improvised and credit where credit is due. Clapiche didn't sheep out and superimpose a bunch of non-actors' faces onto real dancers. He got real dancers. Marion Barbeau is a real dancer. And for as kind of superficial as most of the characters in the film are, she's also quite a fine actor. I should mention that she actually manages to pull off making a character who isn't just kind of a mopey dish rag. Even in her resignation, she really does feel credibly like someone who is never really that outwardly despairing, at least, but someone who really surprisingly rolls with the punches she's dealt. And I really kind of have respected that about her characterization. A lot of more experienced actors would have gone in a completely wrong, overacted, depressed direction. I think Barbeau gets exactly the right mix of kind of ironic self-empowerment and malaise of this actually rather modern, if not entirely original female lead. But yeah, there's really only two main dance pieces, and the ones for La Bayadere are pretty much intended to look rather stagey and rigid. I actually really like Clapiche's close-ups of Barbeau's trembling arms, and that's also just as much more credit to Barbeau's performance. You really get to appreciate how much professional dancers already have such an immersion in the idea of projecting not just with their faces like stage actors do, but also with their bodies. Except Barbeau is doing this very specifically for Clapiche's camera, and I love how she plays into the idea of technically getting all of her moves right, but at the same time, at a more granular level, expressing how much the discovery of her boyfriend's infidelity is quite literally bursting 
jumping out of her and causing this tremoring and rigidity that even if you're viewing it from afar, you start to get the sense of this is elite dancing, but it's not elite dancing done well. Something is going wrong. Something is amiss. The final performance piece is called Political Mother, and that's the one Schechter choreographs and co-scores, and it's all right. I mean, as an actor and a dancer, Barbeau is definitely doing something very different, but I don't know that Clapiche's own camera escapes the flatness and rigidity of La Bayadere sequence that opens the movie. Look, I'm not expecting this to be like Gaspar Noé's climax or anything, but this finale was really one where we could have used a camera that dances itself, that dances with the performers, and the formal emphasis just isn't there at the finale. I also don't want to be pitting Israeli choreographers against one another, but I have to say, for a perfect companion piece that isn't in the insane, whirling, pandemonium camp of Gaspar Noé's climax, you could also look to the chair dance sequences and song from Seven Days in Entebbe that was composed and choreographed by Nikmat Hatraktor and Ohad Naharin, respectively, and danced by the Bathsheba Dance Company. That's some really expensive explosive modern dance, and Jose Padilla's camera and editing really sells it in a way that never really goes overboard or feels like it's too much about stylization rather than capturing dance as its own magnificent subject. Honestly, the places where Clapiche's camera works best with the dancers is when we're at the resort and the characters are literally either just training or practicing or just dancing for the hell of it. There's so much raw vitality to those scenes that they're just isn't when the dancers take the stage. But overall, it's okay. I'm not gonna lie. It's okay. And I will say this, the right combination of fine actors, some inspired moments for Clapiche, and some good dancing, that's enough to make me come out of a movie and be like, okay, I more or less liked that. I'm not made of stone here, fellas. I don't know that that's a recommendation worthy in my book, but it's easily a baseline three out of five as far as these feel-good movies go. And Anyway, that's pretty much all I got. Maybe some of you guys out there who are fonder of Clapiche's stuff than I am and have seen more of his films than I have can give me your two cents and recommend me some more stuff by him that you think might turn my head around on what this guy can do and where he is firing on all cylinders and working at his best creatively. But yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe, bell, yada yada. My name is Ian Garcia. This is Devotional Criticism and this was another episode of the new movie Diary. I'll catch you next time.